showtime. <laughs> well, this is the first year that the students have known that I was actually married to Lynn when I spoke. We usually have kept that a secret. And, well, the first thing that I'd like to say is I really admire all of you for being in medical school. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it. And we're here this year because medical students in the past convinced us that hearing our story had a positive effect on them. And we hope you feel the same way about it. Now I'm going to take you back to when I was 20 years old and pregnant with Heather. There was no reason to think that anything would be wrong with our baby. Their father Terry and I were completely healthy as far as we knew and there was no family history of any problems. We didn't even know that my nephew had cystic fibrosis yet so that wasn't even a concern. My pregnancy went along normally, except I had morning sickness 24-7. I really don't understand why they call it morning sickness. <laughs> when I was close to my due date, I went to the doctor every Friday. And he would say, see you next Friday. That went on for five weeks. I was so mad at him. So finally, ten months. Finally, I started contractions. I was ready. That is, until I was in the car going to the hospital and suddenly I had a panic attack and thought, I can't change my mind. I can't decide not to do this now. <laughs> well, in the delivery room, I saw piles of pink and blue blankets and I thought, I wonder if I'm gonna have a boy or a girl. All through my pregnancy, People would ask Terry, what do you want, a boy or a girl? And he'd say, I don't care as long as it has ten fingers and ten toes. We were watching the birth in a mirror that was on the ceiling so we could see the birth. And the first thing I saw was the head crowning. And I was so excited because I could see dark hair. Yay, my baby is not bald. <laughs> And then the doctor pulled the rest of her body out and said, you have a girl. And he placed her on my abdomen. And suddenly my eyes locked on her arms. They were so bent. But immediately I went into denial. They're not bent. They just look that way. Because she's been cramped in a small space for 10 months. They're going to straighten out after a while. Denial. But then Terry said, what's wrong with her arms? And then I knew it was true. Something was wrong with her arms. So I asked the doctor, is everything else okay besides her arms? And he said, well, she only has eight fingers and eight toes, which I couldn't believe. All of it was so unreal. I just could not believe what was happening. I just wanted to go home and pretend like none of this is happening, I'll just get pregnant again and I'll start all over and I'll have a different baby. And the doctor just looked into my eyes and he said, I am so sorry Debbie, this is not the kind of baby that I anticipated for you. I was wheeled into the recovery room and Terry went to call our parents. When he returned, I just couldn't contain my frantic thoughts. I just said, I don't want this baby. And he said, I don't either. What are we going to do? And for those of you that are uncomfortable right now, because Heather and Logan are sitting there hearing me say this, they understand automatic responses. They understand denial. And they've experienced in their entire lives of unconditional love. So you don't have to worry about them. They understand. After finishing in the recovery room, I was wheeled to a room where the pediatrician was waiting to tell me what he had found more about Heather in his examination. And he said, she has a cleft palate. She's not going to be able to nurse or suck on a nipple. And then he said, her ears are small and cup-shaped. And I said, well, can she hear? And he said, well, her ear canals are so small we can't actually see eardrums. So we don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. 
And then he went on to tell me that her eyes were swollen and there was something wrong with her eyelid, but they weren't quite sure what. And I said, well, can she see? And he said, well, her eyes are still adjusting. So we're, again, we're going to have to wait and we're going to have to see later. So later, later that night when the doctor was gone, my family was gone, Terry was gone, and I was left all alone, exhausted. And I fell asleep, only to awaken, like I'm sure all of you have awakened at least once in your life, thinking, oh, what a terrible nightmare. And usually it is a nightmare, but this wasn't a nightmare. And I just would cry, and that happened all night long, over and over and over. And in the morning, I asked the nurses to stop my phone calls, all my phone calls. I couldn't bear to hear the words, I'm so sorry. I just couldn't bear to hear those words. I cried most of that day. Later that afternoon, I started to get curious about the baby. Maybe it was mother instincts. I walked down to the nursery and I was standing outside the window looking in. There was only one baby in the nursery and I thought that baby's all alone in there because all the other babies are with their mother. But this baby's mother doesn't want her and I'm the mother so I was standing there looking in and I felt a warm arm go around my waist and a kind nurse and she said do you want to hold her and I said okay so I went in the back room and two nurses brought Heather in and they told me it was her feeding time so I could watch them feed her. They used a special feeder that looked a bit like a turkey baster, only it had a tube on the end of it. And it was the saddest sight to watch Heather just, it looked like she was drowning in the formula. It was coming out her nose, it was coming out her mouth, she was gulping and gulping. And it was just the saddest thing to see a baby struggled just to eat. They cleaned her up, they placed her in my arms, and they left me alone with her. And I just sat there rocking her and looking at her and thinking, this is the baby that was inside of me. This is the baby that I felt kicking and moving. And I fell in love with her. So the nurses got her and took her back to take care of her because she was having a few problems and I went back to my room. Terry came to see me that night and we were going to share a new parents dinner. While we were eating there was a knock at the door and in walked the white coats. There must have been a dozen of them. The leader of the pack, Dr. George B.C., heart specialist, said, your baby's having some problems. She has a heart murmur, she's aspirating, and she has jaundice. He said, when they called me, I wondered, why are you calling me? Obviously, this baby has so many problems, she's probably not going to live. But he said, I just could not go on eating my dinner knowing I hadn't tried. So we want to take her to Primary Children's Hospital and do a procedure that will give us more information about the heart murmur. So we had Terry and me sign some forms giving him permission to transport, permission to do the procedure, and permission to do an autopsy. So we robotically signed the papers and the doctor left. We waited there for a couple of hours and there was a knock at the door. The doctor came back and he said, if I'd have known her heart looked that good, I wouldn't have done anything. So he went on to explain that there's a valve that closes when a baby's born and Heather's didn't close, but that it was likely to close within that first year. 
but he couldn't assure me that everything would be okay because of all of our other problems. So back then, the health insurance allowed a new mother to stay in the hospital for three days. We didn't have drive-through deliveries back then, but I didn't want to stay in the hospital. I wanted to go to Primary Children's Hospital and be with Heather as fast as I could. Leaving the hospital was really sad. It was nothing like I imagined. In the intensive care unit at Primary Children's Hospital, Heather looked so little in that isolate. All I wanted to do was hold her, but all I could do was look at her through the glass. She was in intensive care for two weeks. I really wanted to take her home. Finally, the doctor said, if you will learn how to tube feed her so that we can be sure she'll get enough nutrition, you can take her home. Well, I was really scared, but I learned how, and I was able to take Heather home, finally. So my life of taking care of Heather, going to doctors, planning surgeries, began. When she was six weeks old, we went to see a plastic surgeon about correcting her cleft palate. I waited and waited, and when he walked in, there was just nothing warm about this doctor. And the first thing he said was, what's her problem? And I said, well, the doctor said that she has Treacher Collins. And he said, well, that's not her only problem. And he really was just cold and clinical. You've all heard that term. Well, I left the office, and when I got in my car, I broke into tears. It was just so painful. So I asked for his associate to do the surgery. I wasn't going to let him touch my baby. Well, Terry stayed the nights at the hospital, and I always arrived at 6 a.m. so that he could leave and go to work, and I could stay there when the doctor got there and hear about how Heather was doing. Well, I was waiting for the doctor that first morning, and in walked Mr. Wonderful. I can't say I was excited to see him. But after seeing him every single morning for about a week, I started to appreciate his direct manner. And I knew he cared. I could feel it. And he made me laugh. He was pretty funny, actually. In fact, after Logan was born, I couldn't wait to show that Dr. Logan because I couldn't wait to see what he was going to say. So I walked in his office and he said, well, you got fixed, didn't you? And I said, well, no, but their dad did. And he said, well, maybe you should get fixed too so this doesn't happen again. <laughs> and it was just, he made me laugh. He stuck his head out the door and he called in his associates and he said, come here, you guys got to see this. It's like two peas out of the same pod. He became one of my favorite doctors and he did a remarkable job with Heather's eye surgery and her cleft palate surgery. So when Heather was about a year and a half old, I got a phone call from the geneticist and he said, we don't think she's Treacher Collins. We think she's this rare syndrome. There's only three cases in the world, and it's called postaxial acrofacial dysostosis, known today as Miller syndrome. Thank heavens. And he said, chances of a reoccurrence are one in a million. In fact, they're probably zero, because it already happened. Well, I was really happy to hear that news, because I wanted another baby. In fact, I wanted a boy. So when I ran across an article in a magazine that said, how to have a boy, here's the instructions, <laughs> I followed the rules. And, well, I guess it worked. I got my boy. When I was seven months alone, along with Logan, I had an ultrasound done because I wanted to be prepared, even though they said nothing would happen. And the technician told me I was pregnant with a healthy girl. <laughs> so 
the time came to go in and have Logan. And of all days, it was April Fool's Day. Can you believe that? He was born on April Fool's Day. <laughs> in the delivery room, it was silent. We were all anticipating Logan's birth. His head crowned, the doctor delivered him. He said, you have a boy, and he has red hair. But it was the same arms. It was unbelievable, doesn't even begin to describe our reaction. In disbelief, Terry said, son of a... <laughs> and I wanted to nurse Logan because I heard the weight really falls off when you can nurse. <laughs> and I'd made a great big cape that said, out to lunch. <laughs> and I was going to wear it in public. <laughs> so I said, well, does he have a cleft palate? He said, yeah, he has a cleft palate. So I was disappointed. When I was in recovery, the pediatrician came in and he slapped me on the leg and he said, Congratulations, you just made medical history. <laughs> I don't remember being offended by that. <laughs> Logan had to stay in the hospital for two weeks because he had the same breathing problems that Heather did. But the day finally came to take him home. So I bought Heather a new baby doll. I didn't want her to get jealous. So we walked out of the hospital. She had her baby doll and I had Logan. And we went home, one little happy family. And I, I did, in fact, tube feed Logan for six months because he aspirated on his formula within a week and ended up back at the hospital. And I just didn't want that to happen again. So I became quite efficient at it. And, of course, Heather, too, fed her baby doll, too. <laughs> so the rest of the story is in a book I wrote just out last November called Eight Fingers and Eight Toes, Accepting Life's Challenges. I have learned so much being Heather and Logan's mom. And I didn't want to die having everything I've learned die with me.